The Gutierrez family of Lexington County, South Carolina, spent the day of June 5, 1986, doing yard work. After the family ate a dinner of bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, Deborah Gutierrez painted her four-year-old daughter Jessica's fingernails. Jessica, who went by the nickname Jessie, asked her mother if she could sleep in her bed that night. Deborah had to tell her no. Jessie had slept in her bed the night before, and Jessie's older brother was suffering from an ear infection, so Deborah wanted to let him sleep in her room instead so she could keep an eye on him. Jessie therefore slept in the double bed she shared with her older sister, six-year-old Becky, that night. She went in to go to sleep around midnight on June 6th. When her mother woke up for the day a few hours later, she found her children's room in disarray. Their school papers were scattered across the floor, and the curtains had been pulled from one window. In addition, the front door was open. Deborah realized that Jessie was not in the room with Becky. When she asked Becky where her little sister was, Becky replied, She's gone. The man with the magic hat and the beard took her last night. In a panic, Deborah tore through the room, looking for Jesse under the bed and in the covers. She tore through the house, looking in every closet and room, before going outside to look for her daughter there. She was screaming Jesse's name the entire time. When she came back inside, she asked Becky why she hadn't screamed when the man in the magic hat took Jesse away. The little girl had no answer for her, but she would later say that she had been too afraid to do anything, including go back to sleep, once the man in the magic hat came in her room. The authorities were notified that the little girl was missing, and the search for her quickly began. Suspects were quickly identified, but could not be tied to Jesse's abduction. Jesse's mother had kicked her boyfriend out of the home just a few days before Jesse went missing because of his possessive behavior and abuse of alcohol. Deborah was sure he was involved in Jesse's disappearance, but no evidence supporting that theory could be found. Jesse's father was also investigated, but he was living in California at the time and was able to prove that he was still in that state when Jesse went missing. One major piece of evidence was collected at the crime scene. A fingerprint on the window authorities believed the kidnapper used to gain entry into the home. It was submitted to the FBI, but no match to the fingerprint was found in any database at the time. Jesse's mother, Deborah, was certain this fingerprint belonged to the man who took her daughter because she cleaned the home storm door and the windows in her children's room every night with Windex, meaning any prints on those surfaces would have gotten there after she went to bed the night before. A new potential suspect emerged several weeks after Jesse vanished. An acquaintance of her family who was living in the area stole a van and drove it to North Carolina where he raped a woman. He was subsequently charged with and convicted of this crime. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. At some point during this man's incarceration for this crime, his cellmate claims that he told him that he had abducted and killed a little girl in Lexington County, South Carolina while wearing a cowboy hat. He allegedly said that he buried the little girl's body in a landfill. The cellmate reported these claims to the authorities, who followed up on the possibility that Jesse could have been the little girl the inmate had been discussing. They spent weeks searching a landfill near Jesse's home, but found nothing. The inmate was questioned and offered to talk in exchange for immunity, but authorities refused to make such a deal. Investigators evaluated the evidence they had against him, but ultimately determined they did not have enough evidence to prosecute this individual. A detective told Jesse's mother, Deborah, two weeks after the disappearance, that statistics showed that Jesse was almost certainly dead. While over the years, Deborah came to intellectually understand that her daughter was most likely no longer alive, she could never fully give up hope while there was still uncertainty over her fate. While she had to live with not knowing if Jesse was alive or dead, she did know that she would not give up on finding answers. My baby's lost somewhere in the dark and I'm not going to stop until I find her," she said in 2017. Jesse's case was reviewed in 2008 and in 2015, when it was transferred to the South Carolina Attorney General's office. In 2021, on the 35th anniversary of Jesse's abduction, a new age-progressed image of her was released to the public. In September of that year, a team from the FBI came to Lexington County to work on the case alongside the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division 
at the request of Lexington County Sheriff Jay Coon. The renewed effort paid off. Just before 8 a.m. on January 6, 2022, 61-year-old Thomas Eric McDowell was taken into custody at his home in Wake Forest, North Carolina. He is being charged with murder, kidnapping, and first-degree burglary in connection with Jesse's case. A district judge in North Carolina ruled he would be held without bond while awaiting extradition to South Carolina. Bond has so far been denied in South Carolina as well, now that he has been extradited, although he has so far only had one brief court appearance in that state. While McDowell is being charged with Jesse's murder, authorities have not located her body. Given the ongoing court proceedings against McDowell, authorities have formally only released a limited amount of information about the circumstances that led to his arrest. According to the arrest warrant, McDowell was being charged based on his fingerprint being a match to the one found on Jesse's window, a witness identifying him in a photo lineup, and his own admissions to the crime made to others. It is unclear, based on the information in the warrant, when the fingerprint was matched to McDowell, who made the identification, or when the identification occurred. Former Lexington County Sheriff James Jimmy Metz has confirmed to the state, a newspaper in Columbia, that McDowell is the previously publicly unidentified inmate alleged to have confessed to Jesse's murder. McDowell is a registered sex offender as a result of a March 1987 conviction for an offense which occurred in North Carolina. He also became an acquaintance of the Gutierrez family after his uncle married one of Deborah Gutierrez's cousins. McDowell had provided various alibis to investigators after his cellmate reported his confession, all of which were investigated and disproven. According to Jimmy Metz, he could never secure an arrest warrant for McDowell because prosecutors believed defense attorneys would be able to convince a jury that the fingerprint on the window had an alternative explanation. McDowell had previously done work at the property. Jesse's mother's claim that the window was clean daily does seem to be supported by the fact that McDowell's fingerprint appears to be the only fingerprint found on the window. The fingerprint was included as evidence supporting McDowell's arrest in the 2022 warrant. While Mr. Metz is overjoyed that McDowell has finally been arrested, he is also upset and embarrassed by the media coverage and statements from the current investigators that have not disclosed that McDowell had been identified as the prime suspect so soon after Jesse's disappearance. It made us look like we hadn't done our job. We had investigated assiduously, he told the state. According to South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson, without this newly discovered information, our office would not be able to prosecute this case. It is currently unclear what new information allowed for authorities to finally arrest McDowell and will most likely remain so until further progress is made in the court case against McDowell. Jesse's mother, Deborah, has described McDowell's arrest and the fact that he is being charged with her missing daughter's murder as bittersweet. I'm glad God brought me to see it, she said after the arrest. I prayed he would bring me through it and we waited for this a long time. Deborah spoke at McDowell's first court appearance in South Carolina, asserting how important it was for him to remain in custody due to the threat he poses to the safety of the community. She and Jesse's sister Becky are also using the media attention the arrest has brought to Jesse's case to try to bring awareness to other cases and other families who have suffered as they have. While speaking in court and to the media afterwards, Deborah wore a face mask featuring a photo of Shelton Sanders who disappeared in 2001. In addition to speaking about Jesse and her case, Deborah and Becky also spoke to the media about how important it is for cold cases, particularly those involving individuals of color, to receive attention from the media and effort from authorities. While McDowell's arrest is a major development in Jesse's case, her mother still has further answers to find, which will hopefully be revealed as the court case progresses. I intend to find my daughter, and I hope to do just that, she said after McDowell's first court appearance. On November 17, 1978, an individual was out looking for firewood near Lake of the Woods in the Wyneema National Forest in Southern Oregon. 
While they were doing so, they came across a gruesome scene, approximately half a mile off of Dead Indian Road near Oregon Route 140. They discovered the badly decomposed body of a young man. Members of the Klamath County Sheriff's Office quickly responded to the scene. The following day, as they continued searching for clues as part of their investigation into the young man's death, they discovered the body of a young woman. Her body had also undergone extensive decomposition. The remains of a small dog were also found. The man and the woman had been haphazardly buried in separate shallow graves. Based on the callous way the bodies had been disposed of, authorities were able to immediately tell that whoever had placed the bodies there had absolutely no respect for the individuals. The male victim's wallet was found amongst his clothes, allowing authorities to quickly identify him as 19-year-old Kirk Leonard Wiseman. The female victim was soon identified as his girlfriend, 17-year-old Cynthia Lynn Freyer. Their autopsy showed that they had both been shot in the head multiple times with a 22 caliber firearm, and that Cynthia had been raped. The couple lived in Sepulveda, California, a neighborhood in Los Angeles that has since been renamed North Hills. They had been missing since September. The couple had been in Everett, Washington, visiting family, along with their brown and white terrier, who traveled with them in a carrier. They left Everett on September 23, 1978, to slowly make their way back to California, and took a flight from Seattle to Eugene, Oregon. Kirk and Cynthia were known to hitchhike regularly, and witnesses were found to support the theory that they had been hitchhiking around Southern Oregon prior to their murders. After arriving in Eugene on the 23rd, they hitchhiked to Roseburg and spent the night in a motel there. A witness came forward reporting that they had then picked the couple up hitchhiking and dropped them off at a restaurant in Grants Pass. The couple had plans to visit Crater Lake at some point during their travels before they returned to California because it was somewhere Cynthia had always wanted to visit. She had traveled in the area with her family the year before, but bad weather had forced them to cancel their plans to visit Crater Lake and made Cynthia even more determined to see it. One of the few items that was discovered along with the victim's bodies was a sign that read K Falls. The couple may have used the sign while hitchhiking, looking for a ride to Klamath Falls. Investigators came to believe that the couple had been killed by someone who picked them up hitchhiking, either while they were traveling from Ashland to Klamath Falls, or while they were traveling back to Ashland after visiting Klamath Falls. They were never able to find evidence confirming that the couple had made it to Klamath Falls. Carl Burkhart was a detective with the Klamath County Sheriff's Office in 1978, and one of the first investigators to respond to the scene when Kirk's body was first discovered. He eventually went on to become the sheriff of Klamath County. He maintained his interest in the case until he retired in 2001. Several other investigators would work on the case for the next two decades, with the collective efforts of everyone who worked on the case ultimately leading to it being solved. The evidence from the case was carefully preserved in 1978, meaning that when technology to isolate and process DNA evidence became more commonly used by law enforcement decades later, the evidence was still available for forensic examination. Investigators began looking at the case and exploring the possibility of DNA evidence being found on some of the preserved items in 2011. However, it would not be until 2019 that the crime lab was able to identify DNA on any of the pieces of evidence. DNA from an unknown male was located on pieces of Cynthia's clothing that had been submitted for examination. The items were sent to another lab to confirm the findings of the crime lab. The second lab produced the same results. The DNA profile was run through criminal databases, but no match was found. Authorities then turned to genetic genealogy and worked with Marshall University to prepare a sample to submit to Parabon Nanolabs in Virginia. Parabon used the sample to attempt to identify a suspect based on the amount of DNA the sample had in common with individuals who had submitted their DNA to a genealogy database. They ultimately were able to identify a potential suspect in a report they generated during the summer of 2021. Authorities learned that the potential suspect had died in Texas in 1996, making it more difficult for them to confirm it was his DNA found on Cynthia's clothes. They then turned to the man's ex-wife and children. 
While they were upset by the idea that he was a murderer, they agreed to cooperate with the investigation, prioritizing Kirk and Cynthia's family's need for answers over their own discomfort. They provided samples of their DNA, which helped confirm that it was the suspect's DNA found on the evidence. They also provided additional information important to the investigation during interviews. They confirmed that the suspect had lived in the Klamath Falls area from 1976 until 1982, during which time he was employed at a local lumber mill. His family was very familiar with the area where Kirk and Cynthia's bodies were found, stating that they had gone camping with the suspect in that area regularly and had routinely driven through the area on the way to visit family friends as well. At a press conference on January 6, 2022, authorities announced that the suspect whose DNA had been found on Cynthia's clothing was Ray Mason Whitson Jr. He did not have a criminal record. According to Klamath County District Attorney Eve Costello, the DNA evidence was strong enough for Whitson to be prosecuted based off of it had he not died before it was discovered. Detective Dan Towery met with Kirk and Cynthia's loved ones prior to the press conference. Both families requested that he publicly express their gratitude to Whitson's family for their willingness to cooperate with the investigation and bring them answers and some measure of closure, despite the emotional toll doing so took on them. While Whitson cannot be prosecuted or found guilty in a court of law, the investigation is formally being suspended as prosecutors and investigators believe they have identified the only individual responsible for Kirk and Cynthia's murders. With the case formally closed, several personal items that belonged to the victims that had been held as evidence for more than four decades can now be returned to their families. These items include postcards, jewelry, and an unmailed letter addressed to Cynthia's parents, written shortly before Cynthia was killed and found with her body. The letter described how much fun she and Kirk had in Washington State and detailed some of their hopes and plans for the future. The letter will finally be delivered to Cynthia's mother, more than 43 years after Cynthia wrote it. In 1985, 63-year-old Helen Brooks lived in a two-bedroom apartment at the Apple Valley Garden Apartments in Apple Valley, California with her small dog. She had gotten a divorce from her husband, Bill, a few years earlier, and was the mother of two adult daughters. Helen was a hard worker, who had been employed at San Bernardino Valley College in the food services department for 20 years. In 1985, she was working two jobs, one as a bookkeeper at the bowling alley across the street from her apartment complex, and another as a saleswoman at a fashion boutique called Lolo's inside the nearby Apple Valley Inn. According to the manager of the inn, Helen looked more like 40, rather than 63. This was in part because Helen lived such an active lifestyle and swam in her apartment complex's pool every night. Helen had a very sophisticated and stylish air about her that helped her in her job at Lolo's. She was regularly a model in the annual fashion show the boutique hosted. According to both her neighbors and her co-workers, she was very easy to get along with. She was very well-mannered, and never raised her voice at anyone. She lived a quiet life, exercising and sewing in her spare time. On Friday, July 5th, 1985, Helen was scheduled to open Lolo's. She did not arrive at work, which was highly unusual. Her boss Dolores was also concerned because she had tried to call Helen all throughout the previous day, but never received an answer or a return call. She tried calling a friend of Helen's, and ultimately the sheriff's department was notified. When deputies arrived at Helen's apartment, they found her front door unlocked. Inside, they discovered Helen's body. No one who knew Helen could think of any possible motive for someone to want to kill her. Furthermore, Helen was a very cautious person, especially because she lived alone. She would always lock her door, even if she was just stepping away to speak to a neighbor for a moment. She also regularly reminded her neighbors of how important it was to keep their doors locked. Authorities did not immediately release Helen's cause of death, but two months later, they did disclose that she had been strangled with a nylon stocking. DNA evidence was recovered from Helen's body, but the exact nature of that evidence has not been disclosed. 
In the following years, numerous interviews were conducted and several polygraph examinations were administered in connection to Helen's case, but her killer remained unidentified. Cold case detectives looked into the case again in 2009 and submitted evidence for forensic examination in hopes that DNA would be found on it. The effort paid off, and a male DNA profile was identified. It was run through CODIS, the combined DNA index system, but no match was found. In 2021, cold case investigators with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department's homicide detail partnered with the FBI's Riverside office and reopened the case. They requested additional analysis of the DNA evidence. Through what they described as additional investigation and advancements in DNA technology, they identified the individual whose DNA was left at Helen's crime scene. On January 24, 2022, almost 37 years after Helen was killed, it was announced that the suspect in Helen's murder was Robert Eugene Wartman. Wartman could not be prosecuted, however, because he had died in prison in 1995. At the time of his death, he was serving a 22-year sentence for a rape he committed in 1990. On Halloween of that year, he met a 49-year-old woman at a bar in Apple Valley. He drove her out to the landfill on Yucaloma Road, where he forced her to undress. He then raped her and forced her to perform oral copulation. He was convicted for this crime in 1991. Wartman was also convicted of rape in Sonoma County in 1978 and had a false imprisonment conviction in San Bernardino County. In August of 1985, just a month after Helen was murdered, he was arrested on suspicion of attempted rape in Victorville, California. Wartman was interviewed in connection to Helen's murder early on in the investigation. He had met her a few days before she was killed. He denied ever being to her apartment or having any part in her murder. While authorities were suspicious of him, at the time, they did not have access to the technology that would one day connect him to the crime. While the resolution of Helen's case did not lead to a conviction, it did provide an answer to the decades-old mystery.